I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is, where's the COVID relief? Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff is here to discuss congressional negotiations and what's next for his Intelligence Committee and a Biden administration. Plus, two of the Republicans who flipped their Democratic districts to Republican red, Michelle Steele, David Valadeo, here to talk about a new way forward for the Republican Party in California. Plus, I have reverence, not just respect, reverence for small businesses, reverence for entrepreneurs. Governor Gavin Newsom gets a bit emotional responding to my question about struggling small businesses in California. How does he want to help them? What about the evidence that's shutting them down? The issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. It is staggering if you really think about it. Thousands of Americans died every day this week due to coronavirus. Hospital systems in certain parts of our state are becoming overrun. The biggest area of concern is the San Joaquin Valley, where some facilities are running out of ICU beds. There was hope that this would be the week when Congress finally came to a bipartisan compromise for some relief. But once again, they kicked the can down the road, at least for a week, passing a resolution to give them another week to negotiate a deal. So what's really going on behind the scenes right now? Let's get some insight. We're joined once again by Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff from Burbank. He represents the 28th District. He's the chair of the House Intelligence Committee by trade. He's an attorney who graduated from Stanford University and Harvard Law School. Not bad there. Uh, we've done the math, Congressman. This is your 10th appearance on our show, the first politician in double digits. Thanks for coming on since our very first show. We appreciate the loyalty. Welcome back to The Issue Is. Great to be with you. All right. So. On the congressional negotiations for relief, there's so much need for relief. Where are we at in terms of actually getting something done? Well, I thought we were very close uh, on a bipartisan basis in the Senate. A number of Republicans and Democrats got together and hammered out a deal uh, that would provide a lot less aid than I would like to see, but nonetheless a, a sound compromise. I support it. Uh, the Democratic leadership in the House supports it. But uh, Mitch McConnell threw cold water on that yesterday for reasons that are difficult to understand, given the pressing need right now. So that's thrown us into disarray uh, because I thought we had a, a pretty darn good bipartisan compromise. And I hope that we can persuade uh, Mitch McConnell to, to get on board and get help to the American people because uh, we're in a dire situation, uh, as you point out. Um, people need the help. Businesses are going to close uh, potentially for good if they don't get it right now. Unemployment compensation is running out. So this has to get done. I'm at the office, as you can see. I'm going to do everything I can. I don't think anybody should leave town until this is done. So what would a potential deal actually look like? What specifically would that mean for your constituents that are watching? Well, it would mean for constituents who are running out of unemployment compensation or already run out that they would get more unemployment compensation uh, for the duration until they can get back to work. Yeah, it would mean, uh, I hope, that we can provide help to uh, rent renters uh, to keep a roof over their head. It would mean replenishing the PPP funds for small businesses so that small businesses can weather this storm, uh, so many of whom are, are just not able to do business right now. Uh, and it would also mean that we would provide help to states and cities so they don't have to uh, do massive layoffs of teachers and police and firefighters. Uh, and perhaps most significantly, as we go to roll out this vaccine, we're going to need the help of the states and local governments uh, to vaccinate people. So uh, that's, I think, uh, generally what these packages uh, would do. What do you say to people that say it is outrageous that Congress has not gotten something done yet on this? Well, I completely agree. Uh, and in the House, uh, we passed legislation six months ago uh, to get this done. Uh, it sat on Mitch McConnell's desk for almost half a year. Uh, now, uh, you know, many of us on a bipartisan basis uh, have come to agreement, but Mitch McConnell is holding it up. So I, I completely understand the frustration. I, I think they need to weigh in all over the country with Mr. McConnell, let him know people are suffering and he needs to, if he can't be constructive, he needs to get out of the way. 
Of course, a lot of the Republicans put the blame on Nancy Pelosi uh, during all of this, but I think what this is also proof of is that those elections in Georgia matter even more in terms of how business is going to get done. There's a big difference between Chuck Schumer leading the Senate or Mitch McConnell leading the Senate as well. All right, let's talk for a moment about what you're you know, leading. Can I mention on that, Alex, uh, sure. too? Because, you know, you're right, uh, you know, Republicans blame the Speaker, but the Speaker is in accord with moving forward with the Senate compromise, which is bipartisan. So uh, it's hard to lay that at the at the hands of the speaker when she's saying let's move forward, uh, and uh, uh, and that's being rejected by Mitch McConnell. All right, let's talk for a moment about the House Intelligence Committee, which you uh, will continue to lead. Of course, you've done that during the Trump administration, got a whole lot of attention for that. <laughs> now you're going to be doing it during the Biden administration. How does that role? How does the committee work change with this new president? Well, you know, part of what we've been doing over the last couple of years, uh, in addition to the very high-profile investigative work, uh, is we did a two-year deep dive on China and what it will take for our intelligence agencies uh, to reorient themselves to that rising challenge. Uh, so much of our resources have been directed to the terrorism threat, which continues, uh, but we really need to address the, the challenge posed by China in space, on land, uh, in the cyber realm and technology, uh, and that's going to require really turning this aircraft carrier around uh, and making sure that we're prepared for uh, to meet that that rise. Uh, but it also means we need to uh, continue examination of our relationship with the Gulf nations, uh, with the um, uh, and make sure that uh, with respect to our uh, theaters of war in Afghanistan and Iraq, as we draw down our troops, that we nonetheless have the intelligence we need to protect the country and keep it safe. Now, speaking of China, your committee in the news this week, we found out that a Chinese spy named Fang Fang was apparently targeting California Congressman Eric Swalwell, forged a professional relationship with him when the FBI warned him. He cut off ties with her immediately. He is not accused of any wrongdoing. Yet the House Minority Leader, Kevin McCarthy of Bakersfield, said this this week on Fox & Friends. This man should not be in the Intel Committee. He's jeopardizing national security. What is being said in those meetings inside the skiff that we don't want other people to hear or listen? You can't he criticized you in that interview as well. What's your response to Congressman McCarthy and to the bigger question about members of your committee apparently being targeted by China? Well, there are members uh, of Congress uh, in both House and Senate uh, who have been targeted uh, by China. Uh, and on a bipartisan basis, we're notified when that happens. So all the faux outrage about this is nothing more than faux outrage. Uh, we were informed, uh, you know, whenever there's a, a member that's the subject of these kind of approaches. Uh, and uh, as your report makes clear, uh, Mr. Swalwell um, uh, did everything right. There was nothing, no uh, a suggestion of any, any impropriety on his part. Um, but I, I will say this in terms of Mr. McCarthy, what he's trying to do is really deflect attention from the problem that he has within his own conference, which is the election of QAnon supporters and adherents. Now, that is a security problem, uh, but he would much rather talk about Eric Swalwell than he, than he would uh, about the QAnon members of his conference. I want to take a moment to, you know, we like to have some fun and, and also reflect on some more personal stuff on this show. Uh, happy Hanukkah to you. I know you posted a picture with your wife, Eve, celebrating. Even for those who aren't Jewish, it might be a, a good time for a celebration of light and hope, right? And, and of course, family. And, and as you reflect on this year and your family, what, what are you thinking about during this Hanukkah? No, uh, well, you know, Hanukkah is also uh, uh, about resilience, uh, about struggle and resilience. Um, uh, against the odds. And, you know, I, I think how fortunate I am uh, that we're a resilient country and that we're that we're a resilient family uh, and that we're getting through this. And uh, I, you know, thank God that we're all healthy and hope we stay that way. Uh, but uh, I look at it as a time to just enjoy something light, uh, something delicious like latkes, uh, but also uh, following on Thanksgiving to reflect on what I have to be grateful for. And that's an awful lot. My mom and I make latkes together. My mom really does the work. Uh, but a few years ago, I, uh, I, I made them on, on the air. So you see us uh, making them here. Um, so I guess we're going to have to send some to you. Please, <laughs> so, I, I think you will. Yeah, my mom would be happy to do that. Um, happy Hanukkah to, to you and yours. Happy holiday season uh, to everybody uh, that is watching. Thank you, Congressman. I appreciate your time. You bet. Thank you. Up next, we'll get the Republican perspective with GOP members who flipped California districts. More of the issue is after this. And again, happy Hanukkah, everybody.
Joe Biden won the state of California, getting around 5 million more votes here than Donald Trump and winning the state by almost 30 points. California voters sent a very different message on the congressional side. No Republican had flipped a blue district to a red district for decades in California. This year, it happened four times. And two of those folks join us now for a special edition of The Issue Is. Let's introduce you to them. Michelle Steele will represent the 48th district, which includes Newport Beach. She's a member of Orange County's Board of Supervisors. She was born in Seoul, South Korea, and will be one of the first Korean American women ever to serve in Congress. David Valadeo will represent the 21st district, which includes his hometown of Hanford. He actually represented this same district in Congress from 2013 to 2019, barely lost the last election, barely won this one. He's also a dairy farmer in his spare time. <laughs> we should point out uh, that we hope to include both uh, Congressman Mike Garcia and also um, Young Kim in this discussion. We had some technical and scheduling issues with both of them. We hope to have both of them on our show soon. Uh, but welcome to you both. Thank you uh, for being on The Issue Is for the first time. Um, Congresswoman-elect Steele, let's begin with you. Why do you think you were able to win and sort of defy the trends that we've been seeing in California? Lower taxes and less regulations for the businesses so businesses can come back. And another thing is as a chair of the, uh, of the county, that most important issue was public safety. Yeah, of course, there was conversation about that defund the police um, effort as well. Uh, Congressman Valadeo, what do you think was, was the key? Uh, obviously, over the last two years, I think there was a lot of buyer's remorse. Uh, they saw the division. They saw the, the back and forth, just nastiness that it's uh, that we're seeing across the country. And uh, I think they spoke up clearly. Obviously, here in California, that uh, that was a strong message with the four seats. Uh, but across the country, we saw a difference. And the, the biggest issue continues to be the coronavirus. What do you think, Congressman Valadeo, is the most important thing that Congress can do going forward? Because a lot of folks are going to need a lot of help. Well, stop the bickering. Uh, they're using the opportunity of this pandemic as an excuse to pull, uh, again, some political games with things uh, that people desperately need. And uh, even one of the members here in California, uh, Katie Porter, had posted a video about it being a partisan wish list and a piece of legislation that should never see the light of day because it is an absolute disaster for, uh, for us to be going through this pandemic and to have Nancy Pelosi holding hostage the resources our communities need. Congresswoman-elect, what, what do you think? You, you head there in January. What's the most important thing you want to get done when it comes to coronavirus? I think you know what? Everybody's waiting for vaccinations. So when vaccination comes, it's going to be relieved a little bit. But at the same time, then you know what we have to do is just open the businesses and let people work because they cannot put their food on the table for their families. I mean, there, there's no doubt that there are businesses that are that are really suffering, and there are a lot of questions about some of the science behind some of the lockdowns. But then there also is no doubt that we do have a coronavirus problem. I mean, you see that the cases are exploding. In the uh, San Joaquin Valley, we're seeing areas where they're basically running out of hospital beds, uh, Congressman. So, so what do you say uh, to those folks? How do, we, how do we fix this? How do we get a handle on this issue? Well, again, stop the partisan stuff. Uh, and pass legislation that's helpful. Now, as far as what to do in our communities, yes, the San Joaquin Valley and lots of parts of California are really struggling. Uh, as far as the open ICU beds uh, is a concerning number, and we have to be cognitive of that. Our parents are really struggling. A school district in my area has more uh, kids failing than they've ever had, and to the point where they're giving kids opportunities to change classes at the last minute so they don't have an F on their uh, transcripts moving forward. This is gonna have a lasting impact on our children, and it's a scary situation. Uh, and Washington needs to lead by example. Okay, so speaking on that, that issue of working across the aisle, are, are either of you ready to acknowledge that Joe Biden won the election? You know what, our President Trump, uh, you know what, he has right to review everything because this, every vote is very uh, precious because this is a voice of people. So you know what, he's reviewing. I appreciate you bringing that up because I'd like to address it as well. Uh, we have a couple races right now nationally, uh, one in Iowa, one in New York, uh, where especially the Iowa seat, it was actually certified and uh, and the person was elected to office. They're looking at challenging that race and, and we're actually preparing for a floor fight where Democrat leadership is planning on not seating this person who was actually elected. 
Now, as far as the president, yes, uh, we we all know that there is fraud out there. Do I believe there's enough to overturn the president's uh, election right now or the vice president-elect's election? No, I don't. But uh, I, I do believe we have a responsibility as American citizens to make sure that every single ballot is counted honestly and fairly in a transparent process. And uh, and I think that process is going forward as we speak. And at the end of the day, we'll see on January 20th. But uh, I do believe that uh, the election is pretty much over. So, so you're saying that Joe Biden won the election? As of right now, I do believe he did, yes. Yeah. M M Michelle Steele, do you agree with that? We're going to find out on December 14th. Okay. <laughs> Okay, this is your first time on this show, both of you, and we like to have some fun in addition to the political talk. We, we play a game called Personal Issues, uh, where uh, we, we get to know you guys a little bit better um, and, and get to know some of your favorites. Okay, so we ready? Here we go. Uh, so, uh, Congressman Valdea, we'll start with you. What's your favorite TV show? Oh, right now, Yellowstone. Yellowstone's really good. I started binging that recently. Uh, uh, Steele. You know what? Fox News. <laughs> My husband comes home and he just turns Fox News every day and I don't watch. You know what? Let me change my mind because I like Blue Blood. And her husband, of course, is uh, Sean Steele, who's a frequent guest here on The Issue Is. All right, now, uh, Congresswoman-elect, uh, to you, your favorite musical artist or band? I love those bands uh, like K-pop and other stuff. One you've never heard of, uh, Poor Man's Poison. Uh, they're actually constituents or were constituents. I assume they still live in the area. They've broken up. Uh, but one of their albums uh, was one that I enjoyed listening to and uh, still like to listen to, especially on my flights home. And the uh, song is I'm Going Home or Headed Home. Look at that. That's a smart politician with a local reference in there. Uh, all right. Uh, and final question, uh, Michelle Steele, who is your role model? Secretary Lane Chow. She is uh, Department of Transportation right now, Secretary Chai. I've been known her more than 30 years. She's my mentor, and she is so amazing woman, and I want to be like her. And to you, Congressman, finally, who's your role model? You know, this one for me is easy. It's my dad. Uh, I think my wife married me thinking I was going to be like my dad, and I'll never live up to those uh, shoes. Uh, immigrated this country, didn't speak the language, uh, worked in a processing plant down there in Southern California before he came up to the Valley. To to start his own business that us kids can work with uh, alongside of him. Uh, great man and, and someone that I wish to be like someday. Mm. An immigrant from Portugal, right? Uh, and that is a, a big part of the, 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 all the Republicans who flip seats all have uh, immigrant backgrounds as well. Uh, sort of a new face of the Republican Party, I think, is part of the message as well. Uh, thank you all, and best of luck to you in Washington. Stay in touch. We'd love to have you back on the show. Up next, Governor Gavin Newsom's emotional response to my question about small business closures and scientific evidence. Stay with us. More of the issue is after this. Cronies in Agora Hills is one of so many restaurants across the state of California that have stayed open despite Governor Newsom ordering them to be shut down. This week, California's Health and Human Services Secretary, Dr. Mark Galley, was pressed on the science behind the closures. And here's what he had to say outdoor dining and limiting that, turning to restaurants to deliver and provide takeout options instead, really has to do with the goal of trying to keep people at home, not a comment on the relative safety of outdoor dining. That answer not satisfactory to a lot of restaurant owners. This week, I pressed Governor Newsom to speak to those business people who feel like there's not enough evidence. His answer was unusually personal and emotional. I'm wondering what you say to these people who say, look, I've done everything you've asked. I followed the rules. I spent a lot of money on PPE. My staff is on the brink of you know, losing their jobs. We're on the brink of losing our business. It's the holiday season. What do you say to these people who are really desperate and confused and angry right now? I'm a small business owner. I started right out of college, put pen to paper, opened a small business uh, with one part-time employee. Uh, was the cause of my life. I deeply recognize people's pain and suffering at this moment, their dreams being shattered because of this pandemic. So you ask me how I feel, it devastates me to know because I intimately understand what it means when you put everything on the line, you leverage everything, your family, your dreams are on the line, and through no fault of your own, something global, a pandemic hits, 
and creates all of these constraints and all these constructs that are devastating to your life and your prospects for the future. And so we need the federal government to recognize that and to reconcile the fact they are not doing their job. The full answer to my question went on for over 11 minutes. You can watch all of it right now at youtube.com slash Alex Michelson. The governor talked about more than $500 million in resources and grants available for those who are struggling. You can apply for that right now at covid19.ca.gov. Up next, my thoughts on who I think should have really been Times Person of the Year. We end this week with my commentary. And this week, Time named Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as its Person of the Year for 2020, following a long tradition of the president-elect winning that honor. With respect to these two politicians, in my view, Time's decision is tone deaf for this moment in time. The persons of the year in 2020 are healthcare workers, the men and women who risk their own lives day after day to fight this pandemic, often working exceptionally long shifts without proper PPE. A shout out to researchers who pulled off multiple COVID-19 vaccines in record time and all those who stepped up forward to take part in their clinical trials. And a thank you to all the essential workers, especially grocery store employees, custodians, uh, also okay. teachers, firefighters, police officers, and others who have kept working. To be fair, Time did name frontline workers as guardians of the year. But to me, that's not enough. They deserve to be on the cover and so much more. The best gift we can all give them this holiday season is to do our part, act responsibly, and take this thing seriously so we don't put them at even greater risk. And speaking of the holiday season, happy Hanukkah to my fellow Jews. But even if you aren't Jewish, I think we can all get behind a celebration of more light, more hope, and more resilience right now. I'm Alex Michelson. Thanks for watching The Issue List.